Museums are full of fabulous motor cars, and this is one of my favourites, the fabulous 3098 Vauxhall. This one built in 1926, which in fact was the year in which they were built last, because at that time General Motors had taken over the factory, and they really didn't want to know about sports cars. There's another interesting car, a star, a name not too many of us have heard of, in fact, because they went out of business at the beginning of the First World War. And another one, Chevrolet, 1928 vintage. Interesting year, that, because it was the year after Henry Ford had decided to stop making the Model T and come up with something new, but he was a bit too late because by then Chevrolet had already taken market supremacy. And another one, a late 30s Oldsmobile. A car, in fact, that most people continue to relate to the gangster period, but it wasn't in the gangster period at all because the gangster period was the late 20s and early 30s. That car came a lot later. And there's another car, but this one you would not expect to find in a museum, at least not just yet. Perhaps we should take a closer look at it. This is Chrysler's Valiant. I guess it's a little unfair to refer to it as being a museum piece, but after all, it was released in VH series in 1971. It hasn't changed much externally, and you could be forgiven for wondering how long it will go on in its present form. This is the CM. It is a 1980 model, believe it or not. And although it is a bit old hat, it does make one concession to the future. It has a little thing called ELB, but more of that later. Right now, let's see what the rest of the car's all about. This is a mid-range Valiant, a mid-price range, I mean, obviously, in that it has a few of the more pleasant options, but not all of them. Uh, but in some instances, we've optioned down. For example, this is a manual version, not automatic. Uh, it also happens to have manual steering, not power steering. So while on the subject of steering, let's begin there. Unless you were the classic 100-pound weakling, you don't really need power steering in this car. It certainly is not heavy. It's not even heavy to park, which is uh, an advantage. And in fact, since you don't have to have power steering, you will once again get more precision and more accuracy and more feel and that will be an advantage to you as a driver. The steering is precise and accurate, and it leads to the next significant point about this Valiant. Over the years, I've tended to be very critical of the general steering and handling characteristics of Valiants. Of course, if you revise and revise and revise a car often enough, you must eventually come up with something that works, and Chrysler certainly have with this car from a car which was a very ordinary handling vehicle once in its history. It now does go around corners very well. It's quite stable and, as you can see, pleasantly easy to turn into corners. The transmission is interesting. One of the last of the three-speed column ships, three on the tree, as it's known traditionally. In the 50s, they were very popular, even in the early 60s. But then subsequently, of course, three-speed column ships were replaced by four-speed manuals or even more by automatics. But here it is, the Valiant still retains the three-speed column shift. And in fact, uh, it's not a real disadvantage. It's not difficult to use. There's a fairly long travel, but it's uh, certainly not difficult. It's not unpleasant. It's there at your fingertips, ready to use. If there is a disadvantage at all, it's simply that three-speeds provide for less fuel economy because there's not quite so much of a range of selection of gears to match to the power band of the car. And certainly, if it was a less powerful car than it is, three speeds would not be enough. But it works. It's a bit old fashioned and a bit mundane and a bit boring, but I suppose if, it func if it's functional as well, that's the most important thing. All right, let's now think about brakes for a moment. And let me also say that there was a period in time where Valiants were not renowned for the way in which they stopped either. In just a moment, we'll find out whether that's still true. That's interesting. Valiance used to lock back wheels and now it's locking front wheels. Comes as a bit of a surprise to me, but nevertheless, uh, important point. If you brake hard enough to lock the front wheels, it's worth remembering that the car is absolutely unsteerable. Until such times as you get those front wheels unlocked, it won't steer. That simply means uh, 
feel for the limit of adhesion and don't over brake if you can possibly avoid it. As a town car, the Valiant suffers the fate of all large cars in that it is a bit cumbersome, a bit heavy to hurl around in the cities and heavy traffic, principally I suppose on the basis of its width and its length rather than its weight or its actual interior size, but uh, we've become used to things that are somewhat smaller than that these days and by comparison it does seem to be fairly large. Otherwise it's entirely reasonable, it has fairly high levels of interior comfort, but one fairly substantial distraction, it is noisy and it does transmit a fairly large amount of its engine noise when you're accelerating hard. So the answer of course is to drive it gently, which will produce other effects for you too in that you will get greater economy, which obviously brings us to a very strong point about the Valiant and that is that it, it has a very good engine. All Chrysler engines have been good for some considerable time, in this case a four litre six cylinder giving good power, good torque and long life with one additional feature that we mentioned at the beginning of the program called ELB, Electronic Lean Burn. Very significant, its major function being to provide you with better economy and I mention it now again because there is one additional feature here provided on the right front guard, a tiny light which when you accelerate more than you need to comes on, you don't need to look at it to see it it just gives you a warning that you're accelerating too hard and if you back off a little and the light goes off, you're running at the most economical level of the car. Now, ELB, that needs more explanation than I can do right here, so let's take a look at it. This is the Chevrolet I referred to earlier. There's something I want to show you. Once upon a time, all of the fine-tuned controls which we now take for granted because they're built automatically into the car were operated manually. Some people, of course, will remember manual chokes. They're not so old that they're dead. There it is, manual choke, manual throttle independent of the foot accelerator, and a manual advance and retard mechanism for fine-tune of the ignition. Now Chrysler have gone one step further than everybody else with ELB. That is, all of those fine-tuned controls are now computerised. And provided the computer works, there is no way of the car ever running out of tune. In any of those departments, even allowing for throttle openings, temperature of the engine, almost temperature of the day. With ELB, Chrysler have started a march on their competitors in Australia in the economy game. This car produces figures of economy in the vicinity of 14 litres per 100 kilometres, and that compares more than favourably with the 16 or 17 litres per 100 kilometres produced by Commodore and Falcon. That alone could well be justification for Chrysler continuing to market this car in its present form in Australia. But they must come up with a second car to supplement the highly successful Sigma. And while we're on the subject of the Sigma, let's take a look at the new one. Just a couple of months back, the Mitsubishi Corporation of Japan completed their effective takeover of Chrysler Australia, following the formidable success of the Sigma, which is a Mitsubishi product. This is the first development of the Chrysler Sigma since the introduction of the 2.6 litre engine. It's called the GH model and I said development rather than a complete new car because it is a development of, it's not a complete new car, but by the same token the changes are a great deal more than cosmetic. In other words the mechanical changes are more important than what you can see on the outside, which in fact is probably fairly superficial, although effective. So the mechanical changes are what I'm principally interested in. Although the first thing I can notice in driving this car is a change which has obviously evolved from some criticism that the industry passed on the Sigma over the years and that was that it was very noisy inside and it is not very noisy inside anymore. That's a good stand-up start. 
Let's go and see what the mechanical changes have made to the performance of this car. Changes made to the Sigma in the area of its suspension are obviously working very well. They've added some size to the front sway bar to control roll and a new sway bar at the rear. But at the same time, as a result of being able to control the body roll with sway bars to somewhat reduce the tension of the springs and give the car a softer overall ride and then control that vertical movement of the car by making the spring rates progressive so that as the car comes onto full bump, they increase their tension. It really has worked very well. The car has become exceptionally sure-footed. At the same time, in no way harsh or uncomfortable on even fairly rough, bumpy surfaces. Now, some changes have also been made to the steering, which have improved that. And that was an area which was in for some criticism because of a degree of vagueness, which is now gone almost completely and to the brakes, wherein there has been a, an increase in the size of the brakes. The Sigma's now up to the 14-inch wheels on all models, not just the 2.6, so that even the smaller engine cars could accept the slightly larger front disc brakes. They work very well, but it would be nice to see four-wheel discs, and perhaps that'll happen with the next model. I guess uh, we ought to try some dirt road. I know that not a lot of people spend a lot of time on dirt roads. But since some people do, then we need to be able to justify cars under those circumstances as well. So we'll use a bit of dirt. suspension improvements really show up on the dirt. There's no question that it works on dirt roads and bumpy roads very well indeed. What's more, because there's been some added insulation between spring and body, it's not as noisy as it used to be on dirt either. Another small point arises from that exercise on the dirt, and that is that the Sigma could use a limited slip diff, and particularly with the sort of power that's available from the very big four-cylinder engine, 2.6 litres in capacity, and perhaps that's something that Chrysler Mitsubishi could consider for the future. And as well, it brings up a subject of the mix of power and economy. It's very difficult for people to achieve economy if they drive hard, and because the 2.6 litre engine gives you performance, there is a tendency for people to use it up and then come rushing back to the dealership saying, but I'm only getting 20 miles per gallon. It's understandable. You don't have to use the power. The power is there for cruising effectively. And if you do use it in the right fashion, you will get up to 25 or 26 miles per gallon from a 2.6 litre Sigma. And of that, I am absolutely certain because we've achieved it. If we can do that. Anybody can do it. Now, to help you to do that, Chrysler have taken the little fuel pacer lights that they mount on the mudguard of the Valiant and placed it in the dash panel of the Sigma. 
and because it is a light and not a gauge which you need to look down at you will see it when you push the accelerator too hard and it comes on and you will be able to just ease off enough to turn that light off again which will give you as close as possible to the best economy from this car. This Sigma uses the new Australian five-speed manual gearbox from Borg Warner. We've waited a long time for this gearbox to be available and finally here it is and the Sigma is the first car to make use of it. It's much the same as every other five-speed manual transmission that you could buy but it has one slight difference. Reverse and fifth gear are exactly opposite one another in the gate thus meaning there is no chance of you snatching some of reverse while you come from fifth to fourth which is quite common or alternatively in the process of going from third to second to get across towards the reverse gear gate in the case where it might have been on the other side but down the bottom of the gate and this might sound a bit confusing so have a look it happens to be reverse there fifth there there's no way you can confuse the two gears and reverse is not selectable by mistake at any time other than when you might be picking up first, in which case you're standing still anyway, so it won't be a problem. Just about the time we were doing this test, it had been announced that the Sigma had become the largest selling single model car in Australia. That's a remarkable achievement in just four years, and it indicates that the timeliness of the Sigma was absolutely spot on. And it remains a car for the 80s, if not the car for the 80s, and particularly since it has now been improved in all those areas in which we the public and we the motoring riders might have been critical of it. There's still a few things to do. It could have a much better turning circle. It's a bit wide on the turning circle. It could have grab rails inside to hold on to for the passengers. We've been talking about that for a while too. And certainly when there is a complete new model, it will need to be a little differently styled and uh, better use of space for interior should be made. That brings an interesting point to mind. We were talking with the Chrysler engineers about the modifications that they make to cars like this and I commented, for example, on the concept of four-wheel disc brakes still not being available and they simply said, what do you think the public is prepared to pay for? And when you look at four-wheel disc brakes options, people don't buy them simply because they cost a little more than the disc drum operation. So, question remains, what are you prepared to pay for? I guess the responsibility in the long term rests with you, except that, of course, if they put only disc brakes on, you'd have no choice but to pay for them. Maybe that's the philosophical point of view that they should adopt, particularly if it means that your protection needs to be enforced. That five-speed gearbox we were talking about just a moment ago was created here at Borg Warner. Its introduction to the local market prompted an interest in what's to follow, a question I put to Peter Mears, their chief automotive engineer. What are the likely technological developments with transmissions which will contribute to greater fuel efficiency? Well, with manuals, uh, there's certainly a move to more speeds, uh, more ratios. Uh, some few years ago, uh, five-speed manuals were very rare. But now, of course, uh, uh, people are, are looking for ways of saving fuel and uh, are looking for uh, five-speed manuals. What about with automatics? Again, a move to more speeds. Uh, up till uh, recent times, three-speed automatics have been the, uh, the popular uh, uh, type of transmission, even two speeds some years back. Uh, so now the move is to uh, overdrives in automatics and um, other ways of making the automatic more uh, uh, fuel efficient or making the vehicle more fuel efficient. We've heard of developments with infinitely variable transmissions. What's happening there? There is a concept now uh, which Borg Warner is very much involved in. There is a, um, a group of companies have got together as a combine uh, and it uses the principle of a steel belt, an infinitely variable drive. Uh, 
So this is this is as distinct from a step transmission. Yes, yes. Uh, so the engine is running at pretty much a constant speed all the time. Yeah, this, this is the basic principle of the transmission that uh, uh, you allow the engine to run at its most fuel efficient uh, under its most fuel efficient condition. Uh, for instance, if you uh, put your foot on the accelerator. Um, uh, and open it to the stage, say, where the engine runs at 4,000 revs. Uh, the engine immediately uh, comes up to that speed, and then you have the feeling of the, uh, the uh, vehicle catching up to the engine. Uh, from the work done so far on this principle, uh, there are some very great uh, fuel savings. Uh, uh, involved over what automatics or over manuals? Over as well? manuals. Over yes, manuals as well. Yes, quite a significant fuel saving um, can be obtained over a manual transmission equipped vehicle. All right, coming back to Australia specifically, is that a transmission we might see in the future in Australian vehicles? Well, we certainly hope so. Uh, with the the way it's going, uh, we believe that this transmission uh, will be made in various parts around the world, including Australia, and. Uh, will be available um, to all the vehicle manufacturers that uh, wish to use it. What's the limiting factor for us in Australia? We shouldn't be behind technologically, should we? The problem here, of course, is our um, small market, uh, something less than half a million vehicles a year, and uh, any of these products uh, require a lot of capital, a lot of tooling to, to manufacture them, and of course this uh, capital and tooling has to be paid for uh, in the price of the product somewhere, so uh, it's a matter of volume versus the economics of making the product. From the stage that they're at already, it would appear that the Japanese will probably be the first people in the world to release for public consumption an overdrive automatic. But it's nice to know that we have one on the drawing boards for Australia, for a local product at least. In the meantime, until we get that, we've got to make do with the transmissions we already have, and some people don't do that very well. So I thought perhaps a few minutes on the use of transmissions so that they serve you instead of you serving them. first place let's look at a manual in this case it's a four-speed manual but there's no essential difference between the four-speed and the five-speed except that the five-speed gives you that fifth gear to run at higher road speeds and lower engine revs so they're used in the same manner and let's concern ourselves firstly with up shifting and although that sounds pretty silly believe me there are lots of people who don't do it very well the most important single ingredient to develop in your talent with using transmissions of all kinds is smoothness and thus shift gently. Don't strangle the gear shift lever, just take hold of it nice and gently and pull it through up to the next highest gear until you're right up to the stage that you're in the gear you want to travel at. It's that simple. Just to give you a little bit of added smoothness, it might be necessary to watch what you're doing with the clutch and it is possible to make a double movement with the clutch, that is to let it up to the point where it just engages and pause there just for a fraction of a second and then finish off the shift. That way the engagement, which is part of the smoothness, will also be as smooth as it can possibly be. And the benefits are simple, longer transmission life, not so much stress on the mechanicals, including the engine, and a better economy because you're not racing things. Okay, now downshifting, and that's a totally different ball game. Over the years, uh, and certainly a long time in the past, it was necessary for people to employ a technique, technique known as double shuffle or double D clutch which meant firstly that it was necessary to blip the throttle, to bring the engine revs up manually as you pass the shift from one gear down to the next. Now that's no longer necessary since there's been an innovation called synchromesh in the sense that you don't have to use a double movement of the clutch. But it is still a good idea for smoothness to blip the throttle between changes. And if you do, it will help you to smooth up the mesh of gearbox engine and road speeds so that you don't get for example this sort of thing which you just stick it back in a second and you watch what happens right it's uncomfortable and it's untidy you get some sort of a lurch and if you're traveling fast enough it's even possible to lock up the rear wheels when you do it, when you do that so how do you do it right in fourth shift to neutral and as you're passing the shift through just blip the throttle bring the engine revs up three two same thing down you go 
split the throttle, select the next gear. Easy, very smooth, beautiful and efficient. Now, one development of that, you'll find yourself occasionally driving along, uh, braking for a corner, and you'll want to blip the throttle. Now, you can't have your right foot on both the brake and the accelerator at the same time. Or can you? Now we come to a thing called heel and toe. It's a bad name because you don't any longer use your heel and your toe. You use maybe the ball of your foot and the side of your foot. But it simply means that you brake, rest your foot gently but firmly on the brake and slow down for the corner. And as you approach, just roll your foot across and blip the throttle in exactly the same way that you would have done if you were not braking so that when you engage the lower gear again, it's smooth, it doesn't upset the stability of the vehicle and it is much smoother. It's not simple, it does take a few weeks to learn it, but it's worth learning for all of those reasons I've just described. Now let's go and take a look at an automatic. Most people over the years have been conditioned to drive automatic cars simply by putting the shift lever to D for drive and letting the gearbox do all of the work. Well, in fact, that's quite true. It is possible to do that, but it's not necessarily the most efficient way. And almost all gearboxes that are available today are at least usable semi-automatically. Now, that's not to suggest that you should use L or low or first, however you'd like to describe it, for conditions other than a very heavy mud or snow or ice or something like that but certainly you can make use of the second range in the gearbox just as you would if you were driving a manual for example in a manual when you approached a corner you probably would have selected the gear you wanted before you arrived at the corner if you allow the automatic to do the work for you it will wait until after the corner is completed before it shifts so, to give you the same degree of control and the same flexibility of operation, you select second as you approach the corner. Now, you are in control of the car, you are in control of when it shifts gears. When you complete the corner, shift back to D for drive and away you go. The second operation that might be beneficial to you is in very heavy traffic. Well, you certainly would not in a manual car be driving along in top gear. So again, manually select second and hold second while ever the traffic is in a stop-start situation because alternatively the gearbox will be shifting up and down and up and down and up and down just when you least want it to do so. When you finish with the heavy traffic, go back to D again. And again, similarly, on a country road, for example, with a, an uphill ascent, descent, whatever, if you've got lots of short pieces of road where, you make, where you're making the gearbox work regularly, then pull second gear and hold it in that gear. Once again, the benefits are fairly obvious. You get much smoother operation of the car, you get better control, thus it is safer, but you also use less fuel because you're holding the engine at a much more constant range of revolutions and therefore not having it go up and down and up and down and use fuel excessively. That's what transmissions are all about make use of them rather than having them make use of you. You'll get all of the benefits I mentioned and a good deal more pleasure from your driving. Good night, back next week. Stay on ABC now for The Inventors, followed at 8.30 by A Family Affair. And don't miss this week's edition of Life on Earth. It includes some really breathtaking action sequences of birds in flight, filmed by one of the world's great nature cameramen, Morris Tibbles. A truly unforgettable look at the lords of the air in Life on Earth, tomorrow night at 7.30.